I'm in. I see you. <laughs> oh. That was painful. <laughs> For who? <laughs> <laughs> me <laughs> yeah were you, um, were you having technical difficulties it, it it certainly seems easy to do these reoccurring meetings as i'm setting them up um i had to use the link from the i don't know i don't know one of these days i get to try every week um <laughs> well we're here we're we're all here for you <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was nice of you guys to hang in there. Um, so it says that we're recording. So I'm going to show you this in case you can't hear me. We are recording. This is uh, starting late tonight. Pay what you can. Um, if you don't like using PayPal, which is what's on the website, you can always email me at sandy at acedogsports.com. You can email me about anything. And, um, and then you can go to acedogsports.com for more, um, for more, uh, for more learning. Just a little, uh, just a little note, Sandy, there was no link to um, the PayPal. I'll look for it. on. Yeah, it. no, I, I messed that up. I was trying to condense it and I thought, well, we don't need to give the people a way to pay. <laughs> well, your My choice. Best my best ideas are when I'm in front of a dog. <laughs> when I'm in front of a computer, I'm not always having my best ideas. Linda, I hope you can hear me. Um, I can hear you. It's, it's really a nice to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so you guys, when my camera goes off, I will get no warning and I won't know why, but I'm going to try to keep my eye on the little green dot. I don't, again, a um, little bit um, behind the eight ball here with the whole technology thing today. But without further ado, I want to I want to bite off this subject because um, I really have a lot of opinions about it. And I think I can come from an angle that you're going to resonate with. Um, I think I can, I don't, I cannot make the decision for you if, if you need to use Learn International Handling. When I say International Handling, I am talking pretty specifically about handling and training maneuvers that are in the premier classes in AKC and are in the um, master's challenge classes in USDAA. Um, Threadles, um, which is a maneuver, I, it's an easy word to remember because it means you go over an obstacle and then you come through the middle and take the next one going out. Whereas a serpentine, you take an obstacle out, you come in over another obstacle and you take another obstacle. So the taking obstacles part makes a little more sense on a serpentine configuration than it does on a threadle configuration. So threadles, when they're huge, don't look like threadles. So a lot of people think that certain venues don't have threadles. But I tell you, us old timers can stand out on a course and say, yeah, that is one or no, that isn't one. But basically for me, if I take an obstacle out and I immediately take the refusal line and the very next obstacle I take out, I want to handle that as a threadle because that's what my dog would want me to do. <laughs> so I mentioned threadles because it's one of the maneuvers that um, some people say it's international handling and some people don't. So if you have a good front cross under your belt, a threadle is there for the taking. So what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna give you information. I am not gonna say if you're at this level, you are ready for this skill because currently our sport and the way we reward in it um, 
is too nebulous for me to be able to do that. So we're going to talk about the maneuvers and time, training goals, competition goals, and value in, in the overall subject of communication between you and your dog. So threadles is one maneuver. Another maneuver is taking the backside of the jump. So in, again, that is something that I would consider an extra move. It's a move you gotta have if you're pursuing Premier and if you're pursuing um, Master's Challenge. Now, is there never, I mean, the backside of a jump could technically be a 270. But the difference is sometimes when the dog takes jump one of a 270, he's in the natural path. So because these configurations have one name and unlimited variations in regards to space and angles, it, it's hard to lump them all into threadles are easy or hard, backsides are easy or hard. It, it's all determined by the dog and course flow. And I've seen, I've talked to judges that have designed what they thought was gonna be, for lack of a better word, a humane backside or a humane threadle. And it, it got lost in translation and didn't work out that way. But those are some of the maneuvers, the backsides and um, the threadles. And then the backside difficulties, which is what I'm talking about, and the threadle difficulty. For example, having to do a threadle that's big and open could just be as simple as front crossing a jump and doing a pull to another jump and, and it's no big deal. Um, doing a backside where you're coming off of a jump and it would actually be harder to take the bar, the dog is landing in the path of the backside, this is again, not as difficult. So that's, that's some background on pursuing threadles and backsides. Um, the, the more difficult an international course gets, the more difficult those threadles and backsides are to achieve on the course. So you could have somebody say, well, threadles and backsides are no big deal. And I could show you some courses where they absolutely weren't a big deal. But I could also show you some truly international course designs where you're asked to do a backside out of a straight tunnel. And it's you got to have some hella mega skills in about four other disciplines to be able to do that. So you guys, there's no skill in the sport that isn't going to serve you well. And there's no skill that isn't, if you're operating and teaching each skill within a framework of the system of communication that you have with your dog, all I'm talking about is you are speaking a singular language with the dog. You're not sometimes speaking German and sometimes throwing in a French cue and sometimes throwing in a Japanese cue. You're, and I'm not talking about one mind turn cues. I'm talking about a language. Um, it, 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 as long as everything is within your basic core system of communication, you're building on it. The problem is this. The article is about is international handling for you. So let me get to that problem in just a second. I'm going to go to screen sharing. And um, that, that's good because I was a little bit worried the way that I came in that I wasn't going to be your host, which would have not been a good thing. And uh, let me go to the article that I do have pulled up somewhere. And there it is. I'm going to minimize you guys. And um, we're going to look at the article before I go into what the, the, the trouble is. So 
I like this little story where I I went to the 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 um, agility field and Shannon Fosty was getting ready for worlds and it was before I did international handling, and I I I looked at that course and I thought, you know, like I said, it was terrible at at best and dangerous at worst, and I really turned my nose up at the whole thing, and then. Um, once I walked the dog's path, I could see that, that there was actually some flow to it. And what happened to me as an instructor and what I have seen happen to other instructors that teach our lovely sport is um, you catch the bug, you, you, you get inspired and you get excited about teaching your students something new and different. And I believe in my heart that there have been times where I have been teaching things that I was interested in because I liked it and I was excited to share it that my students weren't gonna face the next weekend in competition. And I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying that I got inspired to write this article and to give handlers more information about how they want to spend their training time when it comes to international handling. Because I got the bug. And once I got the bug, I could see how, holy baloney, if you learned line setting and you understood course flow on this level on what Shannon was showing me, then everything else would be easy. I could see great value in teaching my students international um, coursework. I had to though um, teach them some new tricks also fun and exciting in order to get through those courses. So why did I change? Why do I say there's a problem? Let's just um, hold that thought for a second. And um, I'm gonna take you back to this course that I have here. So again, um, backsides of the jump, throttles, and then tight to open. And, and I mentioned that a little bit too, that it's not just the challenges themselves, it's the challenges done in a challenging way. And it's, um, uh, you gotta get Julie in here. And it's also going from tight to open to tight to open. A lot of times in this country, we are, um, when we get tested, on a throttle or a backside, the, the judge, not always, <laughs> I wanted to use the word humane again, has made it so we can get there where the harder an international course is, um, the, the more difficult it is to get to the challenge and to be in the right space to handle it. Unless you have all of these additional tricks up your sleeve. You know, can you have your dog on your left side, take a refusal line and flip them back to a backside? Or do you have to have yourself between the dog and the backside? So I just wanted to take a second and, um, and um, say, at this point, I would say my school is blurring the lines of international agility and regular agility. And that's what I recommend that you do is you um, take on backsides and threadles after you've got your language established. And I'll be honest with you, I see so many dogs confused on rear crosses and so many ill-placed and mistimed front crosses when I'm at a dog show that I think that there's a chance that we are inspired to go on to international handling before our dogs are ready. So what I'm talking about, let me get, I love analogies. Imagine that, okay, let's say you're learning French and 
you're pretty good. You're not, you're not great, but you're pretty good. Could you attend a lecture in France on neurosurgery, neurosurgery? You know, could you even attend a lecture on driving school or, or would you just be okay at the restaurant, you know, not ordering liver? So, so, and, you know, at what point is it a, is a, is it a waste and what point is it detrimental? So this is what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about tonight. Um, I got to a point in course design where I was so into throttles and backsides that I had them on in every single setup. And again, um, I don't believe anymore that handlers should be doing backsides with any dog until they themselves are fluent in the art of line setting and lanes and, um, and really understand the difference. Well, the same thing about building value in the backside in the bar. So I've had this ar argument, <laughs> I'll be honest, um, with lots of other professional trainers about should medium level students and I could say that that haven't perfected lines, lanes, front crosses, and rear crosses. And, and I and maybe perfected is too strong of a word. Uh, if you're doing your front crosses out of your dog's way, meaning you're creating an opportunity for the dog to accelerate, and your rear crosses are done in a fashion that you can actually get ahead, you're not trapped, and you're and you know the key elements of success you know the dog's path, you've spent your learning time learning these things. I mean, not everybody does agility full time. If you've got a day job or you've you know got a family and a day job, I'm gonna say get lines, lanes, front crosses and rear crosses and, and tunnel cues, getting your dog to recognize the backs of a tunnel. And oh, 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 don't let me forget contacts and weave poles. You know, there's an awful lot of people that have brilliant backsides and crap weave pole entries. So, and they're never planning to go to world team. So when I've had this argument, like, like, where do we have our students spend their training time? What are they going to perfect that's going to get them the furthest with their current goals? You know, if you want to mock, so you want to get to open. <laughs> um, I've done, and the answer is true. The answer is if they can do a threadle, they can do a better front cross. And if they can get the dog's line set correctly to a backside, they have stronger comprehension of a backside. I can't argue with that. There is value, great value in learning international handling. When you can set a line in a lane and have your dog crystal clear about whether to take the bar or the backside, that's cool. That's fluency. That's wonderful communication that your partner will experience, meaning your dog. If you're trying to learn how to do that, set lines correctly and teach your dog the difference between just a couple of feet at top speed out of a, out of a um, straight tunnel, you guys, depending on the dog, depending on you, you could spend your time in a different way that might be more beneficial. And um, am I discouraging you to do international handling? No, I'm encouraging you to know that it makes the most sense for you to spend your training time there, that your dog has comprehension of weave poles, that your dog has solid two on two off. I tell you what, I see more time. I see more confusion in dogs on their two on two off and the start lines. You know, I've got some students that have snazzy backsides 
and no start line. So I think that I'm a stickler for being fluent before you try to take on the neurosurgery um, uh, lecture in the foreign language. So I'm going to take questions on that. Um, I hope I've, what I want to do tonight is just get you thinking about your training time. You guys know how much time you have to train and you know where, what your goals are for your dog. And I have plenty, I'll tell you what, you guys, I spend plenty of time just making sure that my dog knows whether or not to go left or right over a jump, no matter what approach or speed I'm coming from, no matter what lead he's on. That right there is some pretty stinking sophisticated training, hitting the weave pole entry from every angle, knowing which way to turn out of a tunnel, depending on the lead and the entrance. I'm just saying there's lots to do that is going to serve you better on the average course that may be more within your goal set. Now, those of you that are, you know, you're there, you're embracing these, you're also, you're embracing these challenges, these international courses. Um, yeah, by all means, you'll, you have every opportunity you guys, I could handle a novice course tomorrow and put a shitload of brain work into lines, lanes, efficiency, and clear communication with my dog. So I've got this course up in front of you. And um, this was um, 2013 in Spain. And the biathlon is two runs in international. And it's... Um, one round of regular agility, which this was, and one round of jumpers. And this was my third and last time at open. I, you know, I didn't rem remember clean run using, I don't remember giving them this course and it's not in my version of clean run course designer. So um, I don't know if it's a coincidence, it's probably not. This is probably a product of my bad memory. But this is a course that I meddled on. Um, and uh, I want to show it to you. I got Becky found it for me. I couldn't find it. And it was a bronze medal um, for me in Spain. And I was really ill when I ran it. And um, Mark Cheek, who is a very fun um USA judge, as a matter of fact, designed the course. It was a super long lead out. And you'll see um, here, I've got my cursor up. So I'll just give you a little bit of, um, I had to, getting up here from four to five, getting up to this A-frame, because this um, seven to eight threadle was worrisome and an A-frame going to nothing was worrisome. So um, I kind of had to throw the dog um, at, at that tunnel to get up there to work that. So that's something that you'll see. And the throttle, had, you had to do two front crosses and um, because you had to do nine on your right in order to have the poles on your right. Otherwise you were gonna put your dog in that tunnel. So, the, so the double front was essential for seven to eight. And you'll see after this teeter, so the, the poles were okay, nice and easy front cross after the poles to the tunnel. Um, 12, I was real worried about taking this 17 off course, but you couldn't, um, uh, Nancy's coming in. You see when they came around 12, it was hard because you had all this yardage because after the teeter 13, it was the backside of 14. So you were worried as your dog, what your dog see as he came around 12, 17. So this is a what configuration? Does somebody want to yell it out? Box. Yep. It's a box configuration and you have to pass a box. 
So I have, I have my handling techniques for boxes. And this was a situation that it had better work because I couldn't babysit her past that jump. I stayed within the wing of the jump, stayed on my side of the box, which took 17 completely out of play because I had to be past the end of the teeter before the board hit in order to get the backside of 14. And then again, a uh, little bit worried about 12, but I had to get, you guys, this number 20 was a lot of times in international, the, this distance stuff is used. So if you got caught behind this tunnel again, you, you, you were going to be on this side. There was no way you were going to run on, there was, it was not possible to run around the outside of the dog walk. And if you were on this side, which you pretty much had to be, this jump was just calling to the dogs. So it was essential. Again, this is another box to be here where my cursor is before the dog got out of the tunnel. And um, I went into this round in 13th place. So in jumpers, I was number 13, which pretty much means you're not going to medal. There's only three medals. You can't go into round two in 13th place. But when I walked this course, I knew it was hard enough that I had a chance of, you know, seven dogs not getting through it. Seven of the dogs that had beat me. Um, and I ended up um, being third overall with the two combined runs. And um, it was a USA sweep for my jump height. So, um, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot. Um, Jack Russell, black and white, Shelty, Mike, and Crackers is the little dog that won. And um, his partner, his wife teaches here all the time and she's wonderful. And maybe one of you will remember, Pat, if she's here, she'll remember and we can get, I'll remember who else was on that podium. But we can watch the run and we will now. And um, I think that my camera went off, but I think you can still see my screen. Can you guys confirm that you can see my screen? Just anybody turn on your mic and say yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Show us the video. I'm going to. I'm so proud of it. I want to see it. It's um, Quilly Bear, my Jack Russell. And we're going to make it big. And... Um, so it's, it's real exciting there. Um, and I'll stop it a couple of times. Uh, you can hear Dave Grubel yelling. So I know it's a little bit blurry and I'm going to stop that threadle I was talking about is down is these two jumps in the middle bottom of your screen. And that's a good advertisement for my footwork video. <laughs> I don't think that I could have meddled without this lead out. There was no no good way to get there without it. So this is where I'm already leaving. So that's good line setting, you guys. Quilly Bear is right here where my cursor is if you can't see her. And you can tell that my pull cue and my lane is gone. And I'm just yelling for her to get in that tunnel. The tu It's tunnel to A-frame next. So uh, I'm not going to slow-mo that A-frame, but... <laughs> Mark does have his head turned a little bit there. And after Quilly passed on to greener pastures, I rewound lots of her A-frames. Um, and uh, all I'm going to say is um, sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. So the threadle is coming up next. <laughs> So that wasn't a double front cross. That was a threat, a proper threadle with a full rotation to a front cross. Oh 
to see a front cross at the end of the poles. And here's, so here's the box. So she's in the air. It would have been nice if I had been done, but it's that jump that she's not, that she has to pass. So this is the box work. So I had to change sides after the teeter and do a backside and um, uh, couldn't do, I would have loved to have handled the teeter on the right, but with that box being the way that it was going up, I didn't, that was the place that I decided to make my side change. Not every, believe me, not everybody handled this course the same way and we're almost done. <laughs> So as you can see that jump that was so hard to get, oh, sorry. After the dog walk, you'll see the jump to the right after the tunnel. So this jump you had, I had to run her past. All righty. So I've teased you now um, by telling you to think twice about doing international um, handling and then showing you some really cool, fun international handling. So I'm ready to take your questions. Uh, welcome, Nancy. And um, again, I. I, the, the talk, the article, everything isn't designed to tell you you need it. And it's not designed to tell you that you don't. What I wanna do is encourage you to approach it at the right time in your dog and yours um, journey of communication. Questions? Randy, there is a question in the chat. Okay, thanks, Becky. Um, and you guys are, um, somebody told me in the chat once that, um, okay. <laughs> uh, Leah says, I'm just, I'm just getting discouraged, uh, staring at the course. It would take me a year to get around it. Um, no, it wouldn't. It would take you five to learn how to do it. <laughs> Um, but um, again, you guys, there's no table and it's, and the challenges, I'm telling you, when you look at something like that, you have two reactions, you know, that's not for me. It doesn't even look fun. And that's what I first thought when I saw that course that that article started with, I'm like, this does not even look fun to me. And that's okay. That's okay. There's a lot of, if you're not, if your dog doesn't have a fluent driver, it's not going to be fun for the dog either. Um, uh, so, and again, <laughs> you don't, it, it's not where lots and lots and lots of people never go there and thoroughly love agility. How much training time does someone crazy enough to, to participate in international agility have to spend each day? How expensive it is it to actually go to Spain? In my case, um, crap out. If, if you're, so I can go, I can talk a few minutes about all that. Um, so it's what I had to do is I put it, I went three years in a row. It put me hugely behind financially, hugely. Um, I did crap out the first year. I had my mindset though, that that's part of the deal. I mean, it's just like the Olympics. Those skiers go and stub their toe round one and never make it in. And that's the nature of the sport. It's an honor to go. The qualifying period is hard. All of it's hard, all of it's hard. And I cannot tell you a good reason to do it. Um, 
it was the next feather in the cap for me. And Quilly was, Quilly was, you know, very, very capable, but, um, you know, I, I, I went off course in team. <laughs> meddled in my individual events and went off in course and team. So you have to get help. You have to get, um, uh, and it was thousands and thousands of dollars. The, the cost of the trip was peanuts compared to the private lessons and the um, personal trainer and the missed um, income for to get ready. Peanuts. Um, I'll tell you what's really fun to do though, is to see the sport. And there were people that traveled um, just for, um, to go and watch. So if you ever, there's lots of ways to enjoy international competition besides being the crazy. Um, oh, Becky says, don't be discouraged. I've been doing agility for many years and I would not be able to get through this course with my current dog. This is an international world competition course. My dog just finished novice level. And, and, and um, sometimes those novice courses are harder when they're, <laughs> when they're wide open with a fast dog. So, so we, could, we could have a quick chat about the definition of hard. Um, I think that the thing is inspiring and um, and what it is, like sometimes I'll set up really hard course, you guys, and I'll ask my student, what's your goal? What's your goal on this? And they'll say to me, just to get through it. That's the worst answer I think a handler could have. Um, for my dog to understand this one hard part or to know that I'm not gonna push my dog if he has questions, to answer all my dog's questions as they come up, to break it down if my dog needs to. I mean, that's what I would hope because you can make international handling. I mean, if, if you're trying to get your dog through things that he's not ready for, that's unkind. If you're looking at um, a difficult, handling something difficult as a fact-finding mission. Hey, buddy, you know, if I cued this, would you actually, would you understand it? And exploring timing, those are really cool reasons to explore at least pieces of um, international. If it's just going to create frustration for you, that's not a good reason. Um, Um, any videos of your metal runs? They should all be up there. That one was a bronze run. I thought it, I couldn't remember. Um, and, oh, thank you, you guys. Um, uh, I got mixed up today. I couldn't remember what country, what metal. I thought, wow, <laughs> that's saying something. But let's talk about your dogs. Let's talk about why, when you read the article, what did you think? And you can type it in the chat and I want, I started to say a minute ago and I, I didn't. Sometimes people will say, oh, I had a question, but I didn't want to type it in the chat because you were on to the next thing. Don't ever let that stop you. Um, I'm happy to jump around and whatever I brought up tonight is up for grabs. Um, you can even just tell me a perception or maybe something that happened to you that made you think you wanted to do it or not wanted to do it. Or um, um, I just want you to know that if you're, when you're training, you guys, you know what I want to say about it? This is what I mean. And this is a, you know, Pat White and I train together all the time she's here. And she has to help me sometimes because we all, whatever the reason of how we want, when we go practice, I, I like training, getting in sync. There's different things I'm doing when I'm on the field with my dog. But, um, you know, what we like to do and what we want to do are not always the same as what our dog needs the most. So I really question you when you're in a session that, I mean, I had to talk to Pat about my weave pull training the other day and she's like, what do you got going? And I told her, 
And she goes, well, what are you doing? And it's, and I told her, and she's like, well, that's not fair. <laughs> because I, because I was not, Pat's better at training the weeples than I am. I'm good at it and I know what to do, but it's not my favorite thing. So I want to train left and right. I love training directionals. I love training contacts. Guess how good his directionals are? Guess how good his contacts are? Guess how good his weave poles are? So it was my job to let a dear and trusted friend in on, on my little confession um, and do, and she's like, do what your dog needs. And I think training journals, and I think keeping tabs on skills so that if you learn, somebody just showed you how to teach backsides or you got inspired to teach them. A lot of times what happens is a lot of times what happens, you guys, is you're, you get to masters, almost everybody gets to excellent or masters before they should. They get through novice quick, especially if they're training with me, and they get through open. Open can be a stickler, and then all of a sudden, they're in excellent or masters, and there's a couple of things in their way, either tight front crosses that don't, which is all a threadle at the end of the day is, and they go, I'm going to learn how to do those threadles. Or they hear the way to get good, whatever is to get back, you know, get your backsides well trained and you'll have better line setting. True statement, but you're not going to do it if you don't understand lines and lanes on a basic level. So I'm going to get those backsides or I'm going to get those threadles because someone else said it will fix this weak link. There's probably a more basic way to fix that weak link. And that's where you want to spend your time and money. If you have fabulous, well-timed front crosses, threadles are not a problem. And if you've got great line setting and you know what lane to travel in, your backsides won't be a problem too. Independent backsides at a distance will take a little more training. Um, so come on now, give me some more questions. We've got 10 minutes, Leah. Yeah. It's actually Leah. Um, so I've got a dog that, um, you know, he's uh, he's not a very attractive house pet. He's a pest, <laughs> he's a problem in every way possible. But when he gets out on an agility course, he turns into another dog and he's just terrific. And so he has one private lesson a month, a week uh, with Ashley, I think I told you. And fortunately, we get to go back to that uh, despite the pandemic, which has not been helpful to anybody's training. Um, but I'm not as fast as you are, and I'm a short, I'm all of five one. I used to be five two, but now I'm older, apparently I lost. Yeah, I mean, I look at your long legs running and twirling and everything, and I think, oh my God, where is this going to go? And I feel bad for my dog, you know, because he just loves agility. It's nothing he likes more than agility. You need, you will... It is so fun to teach distance handling. And if you start using the marks and you get comfortable, it, have you watched any NADAC on YouTube? No. NADAC handling? There, there, you do not have to run to have fun in agility. You have to train distance work. And, you, and, and Ashley can teach you distance work. He's done master's gambler's work. But um, the, and which venues? So don't worry, that is international competition. And it was me working with a personal train. I don't run like that. I, I wouldn't wanna face that course tomorrow. I was working with a professional trainer running flights of stairs with weights, a weighted vest three times a week to get ready to do that. And, um, Distance work is my first love. And, um, you know, you can do threadles at 20 feet. And um, don't despair, but do get some nice distance skills. It's just a different style. It's just doing it different. It's not not doing it. And if you go on YouTube, 
and um, look for, Becky might be able to put in the chat. Um, uh, Becky, do you have anything up on YouTube of your distance handling? Um, you might know somebody that you could share. So Becky will put, if, she, if she's up for it, are you? She'll put a couple names in the chat and then go look at that and you're like, yeah, baby, that's my style. You can't do that internationally, right? Some people do. Hmm. There's a dog named Fargo. Um, if you, um, I think, I don't know if Fargo has main te main team, but you know, with World Team, you, I mean, that's their select. You mean just the international coursework? I don't know what I mean. I'm just okay. trying to get. I'm just trying to get my dog back to his weekly, you know, private lessons with Ashley. So <laughs> the dog's two years old by the time this pandemic's going, you know, over, he's going to be what, 10? <laughs> my dog is two years old and I'm in no rush to get in the ring. You don't have to be in a rush. You're fine. You're fine. Um, look up Sharon Nelson, Amanda Nelson videos of some extreme distance handling. Yeah, that'll inspire you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah you bet. Peggy, any questions? Jen, any I have, questions? I have a question or sort of a, and again, everybody, I'm a super, super newbie to agility, um, me and my dog. So uh, I used to show horses on the national level and train horses and train competitors. And so now it's, it's different now that I'm a super beginner <laughs> in a different field, um, but how it works in horses is you have you usually have a trainer train the horse at, at, at a certain level and then when there's a a person learning the skills they start at, at a beginner and they start on a beginner level for you know a, a horse they can learn on and you don't put them on the national champion or anything right away and they're certainly not on their own untrained horse right away i mean you, that wouldn't make any sense because the horse has to be trained by a professional and then eventually um, you match them up. So I guess that's not this, I mean, I know that's not the same, the, the, the idea is you, you work up together with your dog, which sounds wonderful, but is there any way to learn the skill where you're not screwing, like I'm learning this, but I'm afraid I'm, you know, I'm confusing my poor dog who's also learning this at the same exact time. Does that make sense? I mean, wouldn't it, <laughs> makes sense for me to learn on a, on a, a, we had a wonderful lesson horse that was my husband's horse named Bobby Sox. Yeah. And he trained hundreds and hundreds of students how to ride. And he was super patient and he, yeah, he, he got to the nationals once, but you know, he wasn't a super horse, but he could train anybody. And it I is, guess that, that, that there's not a concept of that. And there's not you, you enough train money. There's the, the, the money isn't and, and I'm actually going to ask Jen to come on and, and uh, field that um, question. There's like, there's not enough money to pay me to train your dog. I mean, there might be, but you're not, because it, Jen, come in and come in and answer this, Jen. But my other question is, is there, are there any, I don't know how to say this, retired dogs that could be like my lesson horse, like my Bobby. Yeah, Sox there are people, so many people, there are know. some instructors, lots of them that will have an extra dog or two and you can learn. Honestly, my, I want Jen to come in and just say a couple words on this. Jen, would you? Yeah, yeah, I unmuted. So, I mean, I totally understand what she's saying because that is how it is in the horse world. We don't put beginners on beginner horses. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I totally get what you're saying, but it is different with the dogs. And I, I always thought it was because of the money, the, you know, just not enough money in the dog training to have all these broke lesson dogs for people. Right. Yeah. So you know how I answered that whole thing right there, my dear, and I don't get taken up on it very often is my feet first video. And I can't, I just can't get people to perfect their footwork. If you, if people would perfect their footwork, 
we would have a whole, you guys, there's no, this is why the horse people do it. And it's also the price we pay for so many dogs that sniff and disconnect from their handlers because of this whole thing of learning together. A lot of dogs just don't, <laughs> a lot of people don't have the patience for the dog and a lot of dogs don't have the patience for, for the people. And so um, sniffing, you know, can be the dog going, I can't put all this together. And that's why I am such a foundation stickler. And that's exactly why I don't like it when students ask more of the, you know, they're asking the dog to learn too much at once. And the dogs got tired of it. And, and instead of building, there's, it's like a house of cards instead of building on a solid foundation. And, um, you know, the horses, uh, and, and the other thing is, is the dogs are so sensitive. I know the horses are sensitive, have different sensitivities in mouth and body, and you have to learn uh, that they're not all the same, but the dogs, I would have handlers want to um, handle the same dog that they both lived with, like a couple come in and both handle the same dog and the sensitivities of the dog um, often wouldn't allow it. I, the number of times I, I tried it, I quit doing it. The, I, I now, if somebody says, you know, we both work with the dog all the time, can we switch off and on? Nope, nope, somebody's gotta choose, go get another dog. Um, but yeah, I, I've always, the, um, I know a couple of handlers that have run, gotten paid to run other people's dogs in competition. Um, the handler, for whatever reason, couldn't do the competition. There's lots of reasons. And then um, my good friend Sharon Freilich did a fair amount of that. But um, yeah, having the dog and the handler learning at the same time is, that's why we spend so much time, um, that's why we overfeed and that's why we um, spend so much time, give them a break, play with them, give them a break, play with them give them a break, play with them. And, um, and then also learning how to not be afraid of confusion, how to not make confusion a negative experience for the dog um, and learning about stress relievers for the dog during learning and, um, and then perfecting. You guys, I have lots of students that are not clear about the language they're trying to teach. I'll say, show me your pull cue, show me your front cross, show me a front to a pull. And they've got to really stop and think about um, their cues so they can't be fluent. So there are ways, and I think feet, feet first was my mission with that. It's like, oh, let's teach these handlers all we can without the dog. Let's get the handler fluent in the language before we give them a license to teach the language to another species. If you're teaching your dog, you've got to be equipped. You've got to have your teaching credentials. <laughs> Good point, that's great. All right, um, Any, anybody else? We're almost out of time. Get fluent, Get use feet first and um, course diagrams and um, figure out what I really liked, Leela, is, is, is you going, okay, what do I, what do I need to do what I want to do? And that's, and that's the point of this topic. What do I need? What skills do I need to do what I want to do with my dog this year? If I want to, if I want to go and qualify, cause I don't want to get up at 4am and check in at 8 a.m. in order to run a stinking novice course at 4 p.m. I want to have, I want to focus on rear crosses and front crosses, and then front crosses, and then rear crosses, and then contacts, and then pulls, and then front crosses, and then pulls, and then contacts, and then rear crosses. Not backsides, not throttles. There you have it. He already does backsides. He got that in about two seconds. He figures them all out. He loves, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I wish he, as good as his behavior is in an agility course, I wish it was that good in the uh, 
in the house. <laughs> Terrible well, in the house. Well, then that's but just back to your system of communication. And and I'll tell you, if your system of communication is weak in the house, there's a chance it's going to be weak at the agility trial, even if it's okay in the one on one lessons. I mean, some dogs get so obsessed with the obstacles that they nothing gets in their way. But the, those numbers aren't there. So if your system of communication doesn't feel great at home, work on that. I we just, are. We I just are. did a. I just he's did just a, a video. He isn't a bad dog. He's a busy dog. Yeah, he's got a lot of energy. And a lot of times, I'll do when I was doing in-home consultations. It would be like, okay, write the check, triple the exercise, and call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, ladies. Good, good to see you. And you. sorry about my trouble getting in today. I'll do better next time. No Thanks problem. A lot. Bye -bye. Really good to see you, Linda. Please tell Randall I said hi. Bye. Hi, Nancy. Don't hang up. Don't hang up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Christine. Good to see you. Oh, is the, how's the baby? Oh, uh, we have an ultrasound on Friday. To see Good. What's going on? Okay. Um, still. Did you get another pound? Four? No. Still? Oh no. Oh no. This is this is brother. I know. I figured that wasn't. That's brother. <laughs> <laughs> They're all huge. Looks fat She's and not, sassy. I'll 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 catch you up. Thank okay. You. Thank you, dear. Great. Great class. And you know what? I love seeing the videos of okay. the competitions because they are so inspiring. Oh, good. And I know they're way beyond most of our um, abilities, but not yours. They're so, ins they're so inspiring to see. And I love to the watch thing it. about that threadle is only being in position. You're either in position, right. you're not. All I had to do was throw him at throw her at a tunnel. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> if I didn't have the skill of throwing her at the tunnel, that's the skill that made the difference. Right, right. Yep.